Okay, welcome everybody um, to this wonderful Saturday afternoon panel that we have, um, and a, a rather contentious title, perhaps, um, is a cartoon worth a thousand protesters. I think we have a lot of people with some opinions um, about that on this panel today. Um, and I think, first of all, we just have to, to give some thanks for um, the people who have made this conversation possible, the University of Kuzulu Natal, Center for Creative Arts, the Embassy of the Netherlands, the National Institute for the Humanities and Social Sciences, the Ahmed Kathrada Foundation, and of course, um, Hear My Voice, who are doing all of our technical um, magician work for us today. Um, so of course, the, the thing that we all are here today for, um, for today is to select um, the winner of the cartoon competition that has been running um, throughout this festival. But before we get to that exciting part, um, I would like for us to get a little bit more um, context as to where cartooning fits in, um, you know, to society as a political tool, as a tool of activism, um, and we are going to start off with um, our delegate from um, the Netherlands, um, Chad uh, Royard. Um, you are a cartoonist, but you also have a background in political sciences. Please, can you introduce yourself um, and tell us a little bit about your work and how you, you got into this field? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, first of all, hi everyone. Uh, excited to be here. My name is Chad. Uh, I am an editorial cartoonist from the Netherlands. Uh, I also run a website called cartoonmovement.com, which is a platform for international political cartooning. And I've been doing so for 10 years and I've been working as a cartoonist for 15 years. Uh, so I know a little bit about it. Um, and Tara, that was an interesting way to put it, asking the question, where do cartoons fit in? Because even after 15 years in the field, I'm, I'm, I'm not really sure myself. Uh, we're not really considered to be journalists, you know, if you ask a group of journalists, uh, where do editorial cartoons fit in, they, they won't say, hey, you're a journalist, come join us. Um, we're not artists either, because if you ask artists where cartoonists fit in, the, the, they won't say, oh, come join my art gallery <laughs> uh, and display your work here, because we think political cartoons are art. Um, so, so it's it's kind of it 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 kind of fits nowhere, but it's it's still a very um, powerful um, tool for activism. Uh, it's a powerful form of journalism, uh, and it's also a powerful form of art, um, uh, if you ask me. Um, so, before I tell a little, little bit about my background and how I got into the field, I thought it might be nice for for some of the people viewing this uh, this webinar. Uh, to, to actually see some of my work, because some of you might not be familiar with it. So I'm going to try to share my screen. Thank uh, you so much, Chad. Yes, I think um, that would be fantastic if we can actually have something to look at while we're chatting. Cool. It should be visible now. So it, everybody should be able to view my uh, my screen. This, uh, I, just, I just made a quick compilation of some recent cartoons I did. This one uh, appeared in the Washington Post, um, and, and as many cartoonists, I've been drawing a lot about Corona and the pandemic in the past year. Uh, and this one uh, is about the vaccines and especially about the distribution of the vaccines and how um, the rich countries are seem to be getting all the vaccines and the poor countries are uh, literally under the bridge um, in, in this cartoon. And uh, um, they're seeing the trucks roll by on their way to the rich countries. Um, and these are issues that I often address as a cartoonist. So, so, so two things that kind of define my work are um, a, a lot of it will, will be about inequality, rich and poor, uh, justice versus injustice. Um, and, and I try to use as little text as possible. So I really believe in the power of visuals to convey the message. Uh, and and it's, it's kind of my aim to make work that can be understood within a matter of seconds. So, so you, you look at the image and bam, it's clear what, what, what I'm trying to, to say to you with the visual. Um, so here's another one I did for World Water Day about the uh, accessibility of fresh water. Uh, again, it has to do the, with the fact that some people who have the means will have access and some other people um, will not have access. So, so there's, um, there's often a dichotomy or an opposition going on in, in my work, but also in political cartoons in general, where well, you'll have one element facing, facing the other. Uh, uh, obviously, I also do current events. Um, this one appeared in Le Monde in France. Uh, it's about the protests in Myanmar and the military responding to that. 
Um, it's a really graphic picture, so, so that's also what, what I try to do. So little text and, and just focus on, on, on visuals that pack as big a punch as, uh, uh, as I can manage. Uh, and here's another one uh, on the police violence in, uh, in the US and how it targets uh, well, some groups more than others, uh, as, as has been shown in recent years. Um, and here's a recent one I did on the healthcare in India and the healthcare system, which is, uh, isn't coping uh, with the uh, pandemic. And in, in this case, I made it into a train that's fully loaded and uh, also has a lot of passengers on the roof of the train, um, which obviously uh, won't fit through the tunnel this way. Uh, and the most recent one I did was uh, about uh, about Israel and Palestine and about the Human Rights Watch re releasing a report that accused Israel of human rights violations. Uh, uh, so that will give you a, uh, a brief look in, into my work. Um, uh, and yeah, I have, I, have, I have a bit of a different background into cartooning. So I came into the field, um, I started doing cartoons when, when I was studying political science, actually. Uh, so so um, when I was 18, uh, I think as every cartoonist, I was, uh, every cartoonist you ask will say that he or she was, was always drawing. And that's, that's also the case for me. So I was always drawing, but when I was 18, I wasn't really interested in going to art academy. I was more interested in finding out uh, more about the world, more about power relations, how the world works, how governments work, how, how politics work. Um, uh, but then obviously, because I like drawing um, during my student days, I started drawing again. And I started drawing for the uh, first for the for the political science magazine, which was a little magazine we make with, uh, with a couple of students. Uh, and then after that for the faculty magazine. Um, and uh, I remember one of the first cartoons I did for the faculty magazine actually managed to 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 anger the, the, the university management because I drew them. Um, and, and that's basically when things kind of clicked when I was like, oh, wait a minute, you can put a few simple lines on paper and you can actually make people mad and, you know, have an effect on people and make people think uh, about the subject that you want them to think about. Um, so, so that kind of got the ball rolling uh, as far as, as, as I thought, well, this is a really interesting um, uh, career to, to, you know, um, have your opinion heard, basically. Uh, so, so for me, being able to draw is, is a really great way to share my opinion um, and, and make sure that, uh, that other people see that opinion and other people uh, talk about the subject that I, that I kind of think it's important they talk about or they think about. Yeah, fantastic. Um, thank you so much for that and for showing us some of your work. That was really great. I'd love to know what the cartoon was that pissed, um, pissed off the administration at the university. Um, <laughs> but I, I also, I really like what you were saying about um, cartoons as kind of a universal um, language in a way and, and how God, you yeah. are really kind of making an effort to um, to make them as accessible and kind of as simple in a way um, as possible. And I think that there's, um, there's definitely a lot to be said for cartoons as a medium that are kind of a universal um, language. Um, I do realize that I forgot to introduce myself, um, <laughs> you, as I usually do. Um, my name is um, Tara Weber. Um, I work at the Johannesburg Art Gallery. I'm also an independent um, curator, um, researcher, and gardener. <laughs> um, and I, uh, in 2019, I um, co-curated the exhibition, um, The Art of Comics, which was a dialogue between French comics um, and South African comics. And then um, in 2020, I co-curated again an online um, exhibition um, called Afropolitan Comics, um, of which uh, Tayo was actually a uh, featured as well. Um, so that's my that's my background. I would love to actually go on to to introduce um, Dr. Nanda Subin and if you can can talk to us a little bit maybe about that concept um, of comics and cartooning as a kind of a little bit of a universal language and something which does sort of straddle um, you know fine art and um, political political commentary and an activism. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about some of the work that you've been involved in um, and some of your activism and, and where cartooning has fitted into your career. Uh, <coughs> I, basically, I'm, I'm an artist and I wasn't meant to be a cartoonist. 
I became a cartoonist because of the situation of apartheid. Uh, I was uh, part of the fourth removal, and, I, I, and it was the most traumatic time in, in our life, being uh, put on a truck and moved like uh, Jews and uh, going to Auschwitz. And, and it was the, I became an activist because of that uh, and, and the discrimination, and also the fact that we were always seen as being stupid. I used to be called a coolie cartoonist, and uh, uh, I was one of two black cartoonists, first black cartoonists in this country during apartheid. I was an under cartoonist, and uh, I wasn't meant to be a cartoonist. I just became a cartoonist because of the situation. Uh, before that, I also exhibited my work as, a, as an artist uh, based on forced removal, which was open by uh, Dr. Alan Payton, a uh, writer. Uh, and I also have an Amnesty International Award. Um, and recently, I, I have a school the school I teach fine art animation and design, and, uh, and uh, quite a few cartoonists have come up. And uh, I did a cartoon on Zuma, but, uh, the Gupta is putting a uh, finger up Zuma's butt, and Zuma gave me two fingers. Through um, all my computers, stolen, my accreditation for the school taken away, the funding taken away. And, Caught for five years, and I just won a recent court. And lucky that Zuma is out of the place. Uh, the Orcs are investigating it. And so um, it's it's been actually being a cartoonist in KZN, in, in, in the same city as, as Zuma. And I see that you you actually have some of the your um, is that your work in the background there? Yeah, that's, actually that's uh, the first. Uh, it, it was actually before my time. That's first the architect of apartheid, and I was asked to do this cartoon by the museum, the local history museum, and that's uh, one of the the first uh, activist who had to flee to the, uh, the United States and he was thrown a building in the, in the US. And I did a cartoon and that was one of his famous uh, photographs where you the smoking, I smoke going on to first foot and I animated it. Uh, the smoke goes on to first foot and first foot topples and then it falls down and then the pen goes to it, stabbed into the butt, and the, the ink from the pen falls over its black ink, and the pen is black. So, Nanda, I'm just that's going one to... of my animation. Nanda, your connection is a little bit, um, a little bit slow. Um, so, I yeah, think I, I see that I went up and my dad was speaking. I think that um, I think that maybe I'm going to move on. Um, I'm going to move on to Andy. Andy, if you wouldn't, I know I'm. I'm sure that you it's you both know each other. Andy, perhaps you can um, can also maybe elaborate a little bit further on some of um, Nanda's work as well. Um, and then Nanda will come back around to you, um, and hopefully um, we'll have a little bit of a connection there. Um, and here's some more of your work. I know that you've also had um, exhibitions. Um, you know, internationally of your work as well. So um, I'm sure that you have a lot more to say about that, the relationship between comics and art. Um, Andy, um, let's move on to you and um, tell us a little bit about your work. Um, for those of you who don't know Andy, I will also um, just say that he is the author of a very fantastic book. So if you are looking for um, more information about, um, about comics, What's so funny, it's a fantastic um, overview of comics and cartooning in South Africa. I know I learned a lot about it when I was researching for my exhibition. Um, so Andy, I'm not gonna ask you to, to do an audio book of this because <laughs> we're definitely gonna go over time there. Um, but I would love for you to talk um, a little bit about the, the context of political cartooning in South Africa. I think a lot of people maybe aren't familiar with, um, with the history and, and where it came from and the role that it's, it's played. 
Thanks, Tara. Okay, my name is Andy Mason. My pseudonym or nom de plume is Andy Mason. Um, I work mainly as a um, as an underground and educational cartoonist, and I have been publishing um, comics uh, with an X um, since uh, the 19, late 1970s. My first uh, real comic strip was published in, in the student press in the student newspapers of uh, Cape Town and Durban universities. Um, it was called Vitok and Azania, Vitok meaning white guy, Azania being the name that the, um, that the PAC and the sort of black consciousness movement wanted for the new South Africa. Um, from then on, I, um, when I left university, I went to live in Johannesburg and I, I was invited to uh, work for Raven Press, who were the publishers of Staff Rider magazines and, uh, magazine and many other um, uh, works of literature by, um, by black um, writers. It was the first black publishing com company in South Africa and it was very much um, orientated towards the black consciousness ideology. So I sort of cut my teeth uh, with all these black consciousness um, revolutionaries, uh, um, very, very inspiring people. And I kind of, that kicked me off. One of the people that I met at Staff Rider was Mohorotsi Machumi, who's my own age. He was the only black cartoonist that I'd met at that time who was interested in comics. And we, we, we were, I was asked by a magazine called Learn and Teach to come up with a, a comic strip about township life which I knew nothing about. So the two of us collaborated to create a, a comic called Sloppy, which ran in Learn and Teach magazine for about well over 10 years. It's the longest running township strip, which uh, we worked on together in, initially and then Mohorotsi took over and, and um, continued to draw it for, for more than a decade. And then um, just as a matter of interest, he then continued with his autobiography and um, the first two uh, uh, um, volumes of the autobiography of the trilogy called 360 Degrees have recently uh, been published by Editions Comboracus in Paris. So that's the first um, autobiographical graphic novel to come out of this country by a black, uh, by a black if, artist. If anyone is looking for that, this is what, um, this is what it looks like. Um, I think that I did see some, some copies available at, um, at uh, Keller Kettler um, Library in Johannesburg, if you are in Johannesburg. Otherwise, I did have to specially order this, um, this copy because it is quite hard to come by, but I highly, highly suggest that you do. Um, and then Andy, I just, um, before you go on, I just wanted to, um, to chat to you maybe a little bit of a personal kind of point of interest, um, you know, of Mohorosi Mushumi as kind of one of the, the first, <clears throat> you know, um, serious kind of black comics artists in South Africa. Um, I have been doing a little bit of um, a little bit of research in um, some of the older Bantu World magazines from you know the 1940s and 50s, um, and I was wondering, I mean, who who was responsible for the comics in in those? Do you happen to know? Out of curiosity. Yes. So Len Sack was one of the um, was was the first really important black cartoonist in South Africa, except that he wasn't black. He was a white Jewish man who seldom set foot in the townships. But um, he had this amazing sort of humanistic worldview, which in that, uh, enabled him to draw for uh, what was initially, well, I don't think he was drawing for it when it was called the Bantu world, but it was when it was called the world, he started drawing for it. And then he, his career went all the way through to the days of the Sowetan and, and in the, in, in the and in the late 90s, he was still producing cartoons as an elderly person. Um, I don't really think his work has been published at the moment, but he's still around. He lives in Johannesburg. Um, and, um, and then there's a number of other white um, cartoonists who also contributed to uh, those um, magazines in the 50s and 60s. But it was really only in the 70s with the, with the rise of the, um, of, you know, post-1976 um, when, um, when um, international funding started to be provided to activists in South Africa who were denied access to, um, to the mass media and the newspapers 
um, as Nanda will tell you, were very, you know, they were very uh, slow in, in employing black cartoonists. So um, the, the, um, the activist community in this country get, got hold of funding, international funding, from, from, the, from the Netherlands, from um, Britain and the United States, from other European countries. And that money then fueled this amazing kind of um, renaissance of, uh, of, of, um, of publishing, almost like underground publishing. It was sort of very boots and all do it yourself kind of publishing thing. And one of the, uh, one of the characteristics of it was that most of these publications carried comics. So I, I had just come out of university at that stage. So I got a lot of opportunity to make what used to be, uh, 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 I grew up on the underground comics movement of the, well, I first I grew up on, on American comics, Marvel comics and DC comics and the silver age of, of American comics. And then, um, and then I started reading the underground comics from the, six, the late sixties and the seventies. Um, and I copied that style. And then there was lots of opportunities for me to work as a cartoonist in, in my twenties. One of the first projects that I did was, uh, was a history of South Africa, a cartoon history of South Africa called Vizzy Goes Back, which was published in the People's Workbook. And then I, I joined Staff Writer Magazine and I did uh, with, uh, with Mohorozzi Machini, I did the Sloppy Comic for Learn and Teach Magazine. I did comics for Upbeat Magazine, New Ground Magazine. Um, and then I later on moved back to Durban and started working for street law. Uh, and I illustrated a series of manuals on South African law, which was part of the, the legal education um, aspect, which was very much an internationally funded component of the anti-apartheid struggle. So the whole idea that black people had equal um, uh, access to to the, to the law and uh, uh, the legal system in general was something that was not widely known in South Africa. So the, and from that, I, uh, my, a business grew up around that activity of mine, which was called Artworks Communications. It was the first desktop publishing company in Durban and um, it's still going today. It's 100% black owned now. And um, it's still uh, just celebrated 35 years of, of graphic excellence as they call it. And in the meantime, I went back to university, did my master's, and in, for my master's thesis, I did a, a, my dissertation, was called Black and White and Ink, and it was, a, it was a study of whether or not political cartooning made a difference in the South African struggle, whether political cartooning and also educational cartooning and comics, did they contribute to the overthrow of apartheid? And um, my conclusion was, that they had made a significant, uh, uh, it wasn't a very large contribution, but it was definitely a significant cont uh, contribution. Then my, um, my thesis got picked up by um, Double Storybooks, which was part of Juta and Company, and it was then published as What's So Funny. And I spent another six years researching What's So Funny. I interviewed every single um, South African cartoonist um, of any consequence. Nanda was one of the cartoonists who provided me with the back cover blurb. Thanks Nanda for that once again. And, um, and that book then has since then, uh, I was always worried that somebody would write a better book, but so far nobody has. It's, uh, it's in a sense the, 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 um, you know, the main work on, on, on that topic. So in the process of doing that, um, I learned a lot about uh, political cartooning, not only in South Africa, but around the world. So it was a form of, um, of education. And then in 2008, I moved from Durban. I gave up, uh, um, sort of retired from the business world, and then I moved to Cape Town to pursue my own uh, interests um, in, in, in cartooning. And I, uh, I um, was involved in starting up a center at um, Stellenbosch University called the Center for Comic Illustrative and Book Arts, CCIBA. And um, from that um, institution, we then started really developing uh, public consciousness around not only political cartooning, but also comics as well. And then um, out of those initiatives and um, joining hands with people like Moray Roder, who was a, a pioneer of comics in South Africa, um, uh, the, uh, the, 
the um, evolution of the South African comics community, which is quite developed now, um, evolved. So I've, I've had a, I've been lucky enough to, to be able to play a role in the development of cartooning in South Africa. And it's, um, it's ongoing, you know, and now with all the um, opportunities that have arisen, technological opportunities that have arisen for people to publish their work, um, I think um, cartooning is very much a part of the South African, um, uh, you know, um, environment, uh, cultural environment. Um, and um, there's, I'm, still, I'm still busy running courses and uh, teaching um, uh, emergent cartoonists. So I think it's a very vibrant uh, field in South Africa. And uh, uh, later on, I think we're gonna talk a little bit about, um, you know, what's more important, a thousand protesters or a single cartoon? And I've got certainly, some um, ideas on that topic, yeah. Uh, certainly we're gonna talk a little bit more about that. Thanks, Andy, thank you so much. Um, I think that, you know, with all of the participants, you know, what's been coming through, I think a lot as well. And I think maybe what, what Andy has, has touched on as well, and what, what Nanda was touching on is, you know, the, the thing of, you know, whatever is also cheap to kind of produce. And I think that in terms of um, cartoons and comics as, as their kind of role in the struggle, I mean, you, you know, it's, it's nice to have a great book, you know, like, um, you know, What's So Funny, which is quite formally published, but I think that, you know, comics can, can appear in, in any sort of format. I think the zine format, you know, which is kind of very kind of quick to sort of produce, to photocopy, to distribute, um, which can operate outside of mainstream media as well. Um, I think that, that, you know, these are things that were incredibly um, important in terms of the, the actual role of um, cartooning and, and what makes it such a fantastic medium. Um, so I definitely would like to chat a little bit more about that. Can I make uh, just a little comment about that? Uh, um, so in the last, a few weeks ago, there was a huge fire which swept um, across Table Mountain and um, into the um, University of Cape Town and the Jagger Library in the University of Cape Town. Uh, the reading room there was burnt down. Um, so I was very interested to discover uh, whether or not any of the books that I'd worked in over the years were in the library. And, um, and I did a search of, the, of their online catalog and I discovered that yes, many of them were there, but we still don't know which, which parts of the library were, were burnt and which weren't. But it was very um, interesting for me to see how many of these small, publications which were produced in relatively few copies, you know, like in hundreds of copies or a couple of thousand copies, but they were generally uh, produced for a specific uh, project or for in response to a particular political situation, and they were distributed by hand and you would think they would disappear. But in fact, they were in that library. And, um, and uh, so even although a publication may have um, a very small circulation, the actual physical publication itself becomes part of the record. It becomes part of the um, of the identity of, uh, of, of of the political movements in this country. And I think um, that was actually, while it was shocking to to imagine all of those books uh, being burnt in the fire, uh, one also realised that the act of publishing, of making small publications, has a has a you know it has a historical and political function, which. A lot of people don't really think of, you know. Um, and also the other thing I would also say in that connection is that as we move more and more into online environments, you know, the, 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 the possibilities that paper-based uh, comics and cartoon anthologies will disappear is actually quite a, a, a great possibility. And I think to actually lose the physical um, uh, comic book itself, you know, um, is, is a great pity, and I think that, um, and you know, most cartoonists these days are, and, and, and especially young comic uh, authors, people, aspirant comic authors, everybody's focusing on the online environment, and there's literally millions and millions of comics in the online environment, but the actual tactile experience of having a comic, taking it to bed with a cup of coffee and reading it yourself to sleep, um, is something that is it's a great pity if we lose that, you know. Look, I mean, Andy, to be honest, I don't think we will. I mean, I know a lot of people who are working in the in the online space. Um, you know, it's still extremely aspirational to to produce a physical a physical comic. Um, I hope so, yeah. There are, you know, there are 
lots of interesting possibilities that are opened up by, you know, even places like Instagram, um, you know, where you have this, this one account, um, Taco Universe, which, I mean, the whole thing is just kind of this infinite canvas, which is kind of really quite exciting. Mm. Um, I think definitely we have um, a lot of ammunition to, to talk further about. Um, I would love to, to introduce um, Tayo, um, our final panelist. And Tayo, yeah, I, I would love to, to hear um, a little bit more about um, your take on you know, the, the context of um, political cartooning in Nigeria and also um, the work that you were doing ongoing, um, which is your series um, Roots, which is you know, sort of about um, documenting black history and to, to talk about that kind of documenting history as a radical act um, in and of itself. So please um, introduce yourself. And um, I know that you've also prepared um, some comics for people who may not be as familiar with your work. Um, but yes, welcome. Thank you very much, Tara. And um, nice to see the other panelists here as well. Um, first of all, again, I'll say my name is Tayo, Tayo Fatina. And if you get to recall my name, just go, day you, day you, day like, oh man, I wanna go home. And you remember the name, Tayo. And um, <laughs> I've been drawing captions for so many years now. and. Um, just like to Jared, uh, we most of us must have all started from drawing cartoons when we were teenagers. Because um, um, I began drawing cartoons when I was 17, 18 in secondary schools. I'm drawing on pieces of paper in my school and selling them. So I was into cartoons, and um, I grew up reading uh, Marvel comics. And uh, my my mom would come from work and bring comics home, and I fell in love with comics. But the skill was there to draw, so I just developed myself when I was in secondary school. And I began drawing cartoons in Nigeria. I was very popular in Nigeria, drawing cartoons for various publications. Um, but after a while, I decided to go to America to study more of cartooning. And I went to the School of Cartoon and Graphic Art, which is now called the Cubit School, where I developed myself in drawing cartoons. So um, for any cartoon enthusiasts out there, they, there's the importance to learn how to draw cartoons, not just go straight to drawing cartoons, but learn how to draw and learn how to be um, how, how to make your, your cartoons um, speak volumes than, than words. And what I did through the years was drawing um, um, editorial cartoons in Nigerian newspapers. Um, some, um, uh, some of the time, the periods I used to do that was used under the um, military government and you'd be worried about um, having your cartoons, whether you'd be arrested for, for, voicing, for voicing the voices of the masses through your cartoons. Well, fortunately, I, I, did, I wasn't for any reason um, ar ar arrested for any of my hard hitting cartoons. But after that, like I said, I had to go back to, I had to go to America, after America, after learning my, um, the trade in, um, in the Cubit School, I developed, I got better in drawing cartoons because it was a struggle drawing cartoons without learning how to draw cartoons because I was, I was self-taught. But when I got to the school, the Cubit School in New Jersey in America, I found out the very, uh, how how you can use styles and techniques to draw cartoons, and that be, that made my my skills, my work, and my profession easier to draw, and um, to be able to draw my work and um, uh, at a, a at a quicker pace as well. Also, learned the business of art uh, while while drawing cartoons because many cartoonists learn, know how to draw cartoons, but they're not good businessmen and women, and that's why when you're a cartoonist, I always tell like um I think it was Andy. Um, um, Andy that said hey, he does um, cartoon workshops. I always tell the children that I don't want to be like Rembrandt who's making money from, from the grave. I'd rather make my money now when I'm alive. And that's very important. So I did, so I've been drawing editorial cartoons. I, I do editorial cartoons. I've done sports cartoons and I've done educational cartoons. And that brings me to um, to, um, talking about um, Our Roots, which is a, um, a, a Black History comic strip I, I created when I was in school. In America, because when I was there in America, I was the first African and the first uh, um, the first um, African to go to that school, and the first foreigner to go to that school. But while I was there, I realized that um, African Americans were very Afrocentric, but their approach to to um, being um, and their approach to their roots was kind of uh, based on having a chain around their neck of, of the map of Africa or wearing African clothes. And I realized that they little did, did, did they know about um, the, that um, black history wasn't just history about America, that black history was about history around the world. And with that thought in mind, when we were told to come up with a project, I came up with this, our roots, originally called African Sketchbook because I, I knew I was going back to Africa 
after my education. But when I, when, when I relocated to, to England, um, where I was born and, and I was raised in Nigeria, uh, I was born in England. When I relocated to England, I changed the title from Our Roots to, um, and from African Sketchbook to Our Roots. And what, why, why did I come up with this, um, with this idea? I, I thought that I wanted to come up with something original. And I remember that um, Nelson Mandela said, education is the most powerful weapon in which you can use to change the world. Education is the most powerful weapon in which you can use to change the world. And through that, I'm able to educate on black history on black people in diaspora from in, in, in all the continents around the world. And um, that's what I've been able to do to educate about and through comics in a, in a comic way, that's why I was school anyway. So through the comics, I learned so many things about comics, so many things about the human figure, caricatures, animation. I did everything before I arrived at, um, uh, I arrived forming a niche for myself, which is a black history. And they, our roots has been on for so many, for more than three decades now, which I, I won an award for in Philadelphia in 2018. So if we can share, a few, um, a few of my, some of my works on our roots on black yeah, history. I'll, I'll just click on one. This is the one recent one. I hope I can open that up. Uh, can I? Okay. Can you see that? There we are. Um, this is um, can, uh, maybe um, make it a little bit bigger. Bigger. Um, All right. Can you see that? Maybe there's okay. just a little bit of lag on your side. We can see your screen, but okay. we're still just seeing all of your thumbnails. Okay, um, just seeing some ways. Um, I need to know how to do that one. Anyway, can you see that or you can't see that? No, um, we can see it. You can just double click on the picture on that you would like to share. Double click on, okay, I've done that. It's um, large on my screen now, but I can't see. Can you see that at all? No? No. Um, Tayo, if you just go yeah. to your share screen options, um, you might be able to um, just select between um, the different um, tabs that you have open. So if it has opened in another, um, okay. um, another program, you might, uh, it might be I'm, there. I'm clicking on one now, well, that's open now, um, but that's my screen. Um, if that's not happening because of technical problems, can you guys uh, Permission to do it. Okay, that's fine. And anyway, I'm I'm not able to bring that up, but um, I have some of my drawings around. Maybe later on I'll show that because of time. Um, Let's so take another crack on it a little bit later. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Maybe a little bit later I'll be able to show some of my drawings. Yeah. And um, so the Black History cartoons. Um, if I can do that, I'm not sure. I'm just it depends on what you can see from your end. There, there we go. There we go. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, here it is. Um, can you see that? Good. You can. Okay, that's good. Oh, here we are. Now, this is um. Can <laughs> talk about this is the one I did for Beyond um, on Beyonce. I actually just signed a contract with um, newsella.com in in America. I wish I could show the whole thing. Newsella.com in America, um, in which I, I I was told to produce lots of um, Black History illustrations on African Americans. But my drawings are not just about black um, African Americans. My drawings are about um, um, black black people in the diaspora, and um, I have Africans, I have um, African Americans, I have people from the Caribbean as well. And the recent one I did was the last one, and um, I did in. Can you see that? Well, just give me a shout if you can see anything. I we know can see that. your Beyonce comic here. Have you seen this one? The one um the um Black Lives Matter one. Is that come up? No. We don't. We don't see the Black Lives Matter one. Let me come up with that one. Can you see that now? Oh, man. We can't, but I think let's circle. Let's circle let's back continue. around. All right. So um, so that's um that's what I've been doing for years on um with a, similar to the Beyonce one. Um, it, uh, the drawings I've been doing through the through the years on Black history to educate about Black history as well, and um, um even in um um Oprah Winfrey said um. Excellence is the best deterrent to racism and sexism. And that's why um, as cartoonists, um, we need to excel in what we do. And I'm very proud to be part of, um, uh, uh, proud to be a successful artist and also be a black artist encouraging artists all around the world to, to learn how to draw and also to ensure that they come up with um, original ideas that will sell. Also, and with Tijer, I'm a member of the cartoon movement and a member of other 
other um, organizations whereby I, I project my work there through which the whole world see my work. And then we, I, moved from, um, I moved from drawing cartoons um, in black and white into color. And I always tell everyone that if you don't move with times, times will leave you behind. So it's very important that we need to flow with the times. We need to flow with the technology and also flow with the softwares in which we use in designing and drawing our cartoons as well. So I've been drawing for, um, for so many years, over three to four decades now. And I'm glad that um, I'm, I'm proud that I have a, 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 a wealth, a collection of works that people can be proud of. And I'm, I'm, I'm proud of myself and I'm always is always a joy through the various network, networks to see various um, cartoonists as well. And also, like I said, um, I also said mentioned Afropolitan as well, comics, which I was involved in, courtesy of the French Institute of South Africa. So it's an ongoing thing, working, drawing cartoons, and I've been doing that for so many years. And I also work on very various projects as well. I, I have my first book out on Black history, and I have another one coming out this year. And I also have a Black history animation, which is coming, which has been finished, well, it's not coming out till later, later on this year. So I've been very, very busy during the lockdown and the lockdown has allowed me to embrace technology as well and to, to improve myself in using Zoom and Google Meet and all the technologies that you, use, you can use to enhance your work and project your work to the, to the wider world. And here we are coming together to talk about cartoons. And um, if, if the, chance, the chance is given, I'll be able to show some of my work, the hard copies of my work. And speaking of hard copies as well. Yeah. I think, <laughs> Cut you, I'm going to cut you off there quickly. Okay, um, I definitely, I think everyone is definitely keen to see some of your work. Um, I, think that, I think that your um, your technological skill is very clear because um, we can all see that you've got a, a fantastic Zoom background for yourself, um, which I think also shows a little bit of the scope of some of your work. Um, I'm assuming this handsome, gen handsome gentleman in the background here is you. Oh, um, <laughs> um, but um, yeah, I think that um, this is a this is a great um, point for us to to pause our discussion to actually get into some of the submissions that we had. Okay. So we have here the um, the top ten um, submissions um, from the cartoon competition that we are going to go through um, <clears throat> quickly, and then when we're going to narrow it down to the top five, um, we are going to maybe get into. Um, a little bit of comments um, of, of what, our, what our thoughts were on them. But for now, I'm just gonna go through some of the, the, honorable, um, the honorable mentions. Um, we have here, um, Art is Life by Moses uh, Tladla, who, if I recall correctly, is a, um, a Zimbabwean artist. Um, we have here, Contrast and Conscience by Johan, uh, Johan Kupferberger. Um, and I think, as you can see here, fantastic use of color um, and really kind of um, getting into the different um, different styles. Um, if we can maybe just go on to the next one. We have here Canteen Chat by Stacey Stent. Um, and I think we, we have some figures here who we probably recognize in South Africa. Um, so this is also, I think, again, playing with some different styles. Um, and on to the next one, um, Where I Once Walked by Uluwale Daniel. Um, I believe this is a Nigerian one. So Ty, if you want to jump in there on the pronunciation one. Um, you are on mute. <laughs> um, and we have here Choking Down on Negative Ill Issues by Hilton Forbes. Um, I think also quite a quite an interesting one, also using um, some color and a couple of different styles. Um, and then let us get into our top five. Um, so we're gonna um, just pause on this next one. Um, I think this was one of my favorite um, my favorite ones that we we did get. Um, and so yeah, I'm gonna ask for um, for our our panelists to to maybe give some thoughts. I mean, for me, I. I think that the the style, um, you know, it's it's really great. I think you know, showing a lot of use of sort of di digital technologies as well, and this kind of shift in, in style towards that. Um, and yeah, I think um, really sort of just a very simple but quite poignant image um, made me think, um, cheered about what you were saying about you know using kind of a, as little words as possible. And maybe you also have a comment about the success of this comic with regards to that. Yeah, definitely. It's a it's a very powerful image, and and I, I think you know it's it's it really all has to do with less is more. So just using a couple of elements, uh, 
uh, uh, where every element in the visual plays a, a clear role. So, so first of all, the use of color is really good with the diagonal composition where, where uh, the, the color, the splash of color is really all in the, um, in the right uh, top half, and then as you move down towards the uh, uh, the left corner, uh, the left lower corner, it all gets dark and gray. So that's that's a really good opposition. Uh, uh, so, so so that's really good. Um, I, I like the use of, of digital techniques. The use of color is really good. Um, uh, the fact that uh, he opposes the, the the gray dreary caught up in your social media uh, smartphone reality um, with with this splash of color on the wall uh, just really works. So so there's actually a lot of little details going on, uh, but but it's also an image that you get within a few seconds. So it's it's uh, definitely as you say it's uh, it's really powerful. Fantastic. Um, let's um, maybe go on to the next one, just um, in terms of in terms of time, and then I'm going to ask somebody else for for comment. Um, lending the voice of art in the wilderness, Kehinde or Omotoso Tosho, um, and I think that this one also has to do, um, you know, with um, police brutality. We can see kind of here in the in the background. Um, I don't know, maybe if um, if one of one of the other panelists wants to, to jump in and give some thoughts on this. Um, Nanda, you're leaning forward to the screen. Does that mean that you would like to make a, a comment for us on this on this work and what you think is, is really successful about this piece? Uh, I, I would just listen. Uh, I think he has a nice style. Um, the message is also quite, uh, quite powerful. Um, the, the thing about uh, cartoon to be clever or whatever, but sometimes the visual message in the cartoon is also very important. And I think uh, this, especially with the writing with the story, uh, you have to use whatever means possible to make a Yeah, I think um, I think that the way that they've used the the space in the panel is is really successful. You know how um, you can see that the the image actually is kind of contained within this this panel, which is also then kind of doubling as a as a cell. Um, I think it's a it's a really kind of um, clever use of 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 space and um, and and style as well. Um, so thank you for. For your comments on that, um, Nanda. If we can move on to um, the next comic, please. So here's another one, Artist's Block um, by Andrew Mandaza. Um, and we have here the cartoonist saying, get out of my working space um, to um, an imposing figure who has a, um, a pretty clear view on art based on his tattoo <laughs> that we see over here. Um, I don't know if um, Andy or, or Teo, if you would like to, to jump in and um, give some thoughts on, on this comic and, um, and why it was one of the ones selected. Well, Teo, if, 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 um, if you're not going to jump in, then I'll have something to say about it. Um, what I really like about this cartoon is the characterization. I mean, this guy, this so-called anti-art thug, he's such a great character, you know, because he, he's, you know, it makes this, this cartoon quite um, complicated because he's such a likable character. And um, he's sort of like, he doesn't look very terrifying at all to me. So the guy that so the, the guy that is actually saying get out of my working space is not the center of the cartoon. The center of cartoon is the anti-art guy. Um, so there's a strange interplay going on there, you know, because all the symbols that he's got, the jackboots and the skull and crossbones and the red beret, those are all symbols, you know, they're all well-known uh, cartoonist symbols, the camo pants. Um, I'm on a webinar, sorry. Sorry, somebody just coming in the room there. Um, yeah, so I think it's a very interesting cartoon. Um, uh, uh, initially, I didn't like it, but I'm going to like it more and more now that I have to speak about it because I think um, uh, it just shows you that a cartoon is not a given thing. It's not like um, a, a 
piece of written text where, um, well, even a written text can also be have numerous meanings, but but the word for that is multivalent. It's like, you know, you get ambivalent, ambivalent, where, where something can have two meanings, but a cartoon is actually multivalent, it can have a lot of different meanings and it can mean different things to different people. So I think it's a great cartoon, actually. It's very interesting. I think also, um, you know, just in terms of when we talk about style and um, I think, you know, with, with cartoons as well, sort of like the, the interplay um, with how big you make something or how small you make something um, mm. is kind of as much part of the, the characterization as the actual sort of um, style or um, as any of the other elements of the image as well. Um, so yeah, I think um, great use of great use of that as, as kind of a tool um, in the in the, the comics and if we can move on to the the next one please and um this is a voice of hope by tulani christopher and song um Tayo, do you have some thoughts on this quite a lot going on here i think definitely this looks like another um perhaps a, a digital a digital style um quite a lot going on here we've got corona um and um, an official government official here pulling the plug um, <laughs> out of a, a microphone there, but um, no worries, we've got a we've got a megaphone as well, so we've got got an old school on this one. So um, if we can get some more thoughts on on this one, Tayo, you're on mute. Can you hear me now? Okay, it's well it's well thought of. Um, obviously, the, so we have got the South African um, colours on the gentleman with the. Megaphone there, and um, and um, he's trying to grab. No matter what, no matter what you do, if you pull the plug, we still the voice. My voice can still be heard, and no one can suppress my voice. And that's a a, a good um good take on trying to suppress um what one wants to say, or the and we can relate it even to um the um the protest throughout the um, throughout the war. That no, no matter what you do, we still have a voice. And as long as we are alive and we are, um, and when, when there's, they say when there's life, there's hope. There's hope to ensure that um, you can voice out what you want to voice out. Nothing like the coronavirus or the politician can hold you back from voicing out what you want to do and what you want, what the, what you want the future to be for your country. So I kind of, I kind of like it. And it's, 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 the, the, also in the background, there's a ray of light there that there's hope. That shows a, a sign of hope there in the background that, um, and there's light at the end of the, of, the, of the tunnel with all the problems we have in, in the world that um, there is hope. And I, I think it's a good take on, 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 on hope for the future, hoping for a better future. And I like the cartoon very much. Yeah, um, I would just like to say before we, um, before we announce the, um, the winning cartoon and show the winning cartoon, um, I would just like to, to say um, congratulations to, to everyone who submitted. Um, for the competition and um, you know you, you may not even if you aren't the the, the final um, selected winner um, I think don't stop I noticed a lot of the a lot of the people who submitted quite a young quite a young um, kind of generation of um, cartoonists submitting work I mean a lot of people kind of um, early 20s even um, you know 14. 18 17 so I think it's it's really fantastic and don't stop engaging um, and don't stop um, putting your putting yourselves out there. You know, maybe get in touch with get in touch with Andy, <laughs> um, and see you know see what um, you know what possibilities there are for, for furthering your studies as well. Um, I think that Tayo had some really fantastic advice as well in terms of um, you know developing developing your skills and and actually be, becoming um, sort of multilingual in styles in a way. I think, um, Tara, you, you definitely have, have mastered that, um, you know, being able to, to really have a lot of kind of diversity and flexibility in terms of, in terms of style. Um, so um, as we reach the end of the panel, I would like to um, congratulate um, the winning um, cartoon. Um, this is, I think, a cartoon that um, really shows a lot of technical, technical skill um, and is kind of based off of um, quite a lot of different, um, you know, different elements of political cartooning. Um, and yes, yeah, so congratulations to The Activist by Daniel Sheldon. Um, a really, really beautiful piece. Um, and I'm just going to read um, the accompanying statement that, um, that Daniel did submit um, for this piece. 
um, before we, we go into um, a little bit of conversation about what, what really works about this cartoon. Um, so Daniel says, being an artist in and, in and of itself is a soul-wrenching commitment, but political cartooning can be an actual war zone littered with death threats and intimidation. This illustration was inspired by a photograph that Kianush Ramazani, an Iranian political cartoonist and activist living and working in exile in France, shared to his Instagram feed, I thought of juxtaposing the calm serenity of the portrait with the wild and chaotic strife in his chosen art form. How the art is informed by conflict and an imbalance in society, how he and other political cartoonists stay true to a cause for justice and truth, as well as freedom in the face of extreme adversity and repression against an enemy with vast means. Kanush is in exile because of his cartoons. He says other artists where he lived find it difficult to find work, get mortgages, and even end up being physically attacked for their work. It takes courage and conviction to pursue this field. Um, I think definitely we, we couldn't agree more to, to that statement. Um, so congratulations, Daniel. And I'd love to, um, to get some thoughts um, on this, this comic um, from the, the other panelists. And then, yeah, maybe for, for us to use actually this cartoon as a, a springboard to, to talk about um, some, of the, some of the issues around this, this, um, this topic and some of the, the challenges, quite often quite physical um, as well as legal. Um, so who would like to, to kick us off um, to, to talk a little bit about this, this comic? Okay, cheers. Let's um let's hear it. Uh, I thought I could maybe maybe kick it off. Um well as you said, it's a beautiful piece and I'm 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 I, I know Kianush uh quite well, so so I'm 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 pretty sure he'll be flattered and honored to be an inspiration uh to 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 another cartoonist. Uh um and I think I think what mainly works uh about this cartoon, um, next to it being a beautiful piece, uh so so the artwork itself is really important in this one, but it's also the contradiction of uh being a cartoonist, uh which is often working alone in quiet, you know, but making cartoons is quite a quiet exercise. You you're sitting at yourself at a desk and you're just uh um uh, peacefully drawing. Um and then that's quite literally opposed to the effect that a cartoon can have or, or the, the, the consequences of an image, uh, which in this case are literally visualized uh, around the cartoonist. Um, so, so it's an opposition that, that really accurately reflects the reality for, for many cartoonists where, where the, the act of drawing itself is actually quite a peaceful act, but the consequences of those lines on paper uh, are anything but, but peaceful. So I thought that was a really interesting uh, way that this cartoon visualized that and portrayed that. Fantastic, thank you so much, Chid. Um, Nanda, let's have your let's have your thoughts on this. Um, obviously, as we've as we've said in your career, you've um, you really have kind of yep. been a, a multidisciplinary um, artist and activist, and um, you know you've spoke about using um, kind of as many sort of different tools as possible and whatever is kind of available and. Um, Maybe we can have your thoughts about um, about the the technical um, kind of qualities of this piece and um, and and yeah and um, and what do you think it, it does in terms of uh, political cartoon? What what struck me a lot about all the cartoons on this uh, the ten cartoons, there were not many uh, speech bubbles which is important because it was very visual and it strike. The moment you look at it, you could come from any country. You don't have to know a language to understand what the cartoon means. <clears throat> and that's so important in a cartoon. Great technique, uh, you use pen and ink, watercolors, everything. Um, sometimes it's not about the technique, it's about what you try to portray, but this has, everything and it doesn't have any words, but because it doesn't have any words, it, it makes it more powerful. You can understand what the picture is trying to say. And that's so important with cartoons is if you can look at it and understand what it's saying in one frame, and that's so important because cartoons need to speak to you even if, without words, and I think that's important. Yeah, absolutely. I think it really, it really does capture that. Um, 
you know, even if, I mean, you know, even if we, we're not seeing here, you know, liberty, truth, justice written around the side here, I think it's, um, you know, it's, it's really very easily understandable kind of without the, without the framing of those words. And um, I mean, we do see here um, that what he is kind of drawing, it's this, um, this bird and it does say, Je suis Charlie. So obviously we know it's a reference to very kind of real um, sort of consequence um, that can happen from being a political cartoonist. Obviously there was the, the attack on the Charlie Hebdo offices um, in which a number of um, cartoonists and journalists were actually killed. Um, but let's um, let's maybe go on. Teo, you um, the the man of many the man of many um, <laughs> styles and uh, and talents. Um, what are your thoughts on on this piece? Yeah, I was I was going to say that um, it's very there's um, it's um, there's crisis behind him there, and in the foreground it's peaceful and um, even um, and you can see that he's um, take he's just going on with what he's doing that not none of the things going on in the background is going to stop him from doing from doing what he does the best and that's to draw and also you can see the styles and techniques as well that the background things that are happening in the background but the focus is on the the artist then daniel and the or the cartoonist in, in the in the foreground and that works very well that um even when we're learning for those again cartoon enthusiasts if you're learning to draw this is a way very good way to put across a message and ensuring that whatever whatever your wherever whatever your message is must be in the foreground and that's in the background as well should re remain in the background and it works out very well I like I like the cartoon a lot and um and uh, one day I hope I'll be able to meet Daniel as well and, and we can share ideas as well because uh, like I said it's very, a very good drawing and we can lots of cartoonists can learn upcoming cartoons can learn from this as well that in the background is chaotic, there's calamity, there's crisis, but in the foreground, the artist is just getting on with his message and then, and that makes a good point. I'm making a good point through the Jesuit Charlie um, cartoons he's doing. Great, thank you. And then Andy, um, let's, I know that, um, that this was one of the things that um, when we were having our kind of pre-discussion that you you did bring up and it was one of the things that you really wanted to, to talk about was the, the, the quite, um, quite shocking and, and quite dangerous um, consequences um, that that um, cartoons can can have um, for their authors and and you know for their for their artists so what are your what are your thoughts about this this comic also again as somebody who is um, a, an educator a teacher um, you know what are your what are your thoughts about what are, what makes this really strong um, and also just kind of like the, the point that it's making and the, the place where it's situating itself. Um, I, I really love it for that reason, because, um, you know, being a cartoonist is a strange thing um, in the sense that, you know, the this, this, this solitary occupation of a cartoonist is very well captured here. And then suddenly the consequences of that cartoon hit you. I can remember Zapiro telling me about um, one day he was sitting in his office drawing and there was a knock on the door and um, uh, these officials had come to deliver this um, uh, document to him which um, uh, in which he was being sued by Jacob Zuma for the largest amount of money that any cartoonist had ever been sued for. I think um, not only in South Africa, but uh, around the world, an extraordinarily uh, a, a big number. Um, and um, I, I was, I, I asked him, I said, well, what was your response to that? And he said, well, you know, um, his response was just to dig in his heels and say no, you know. And that, um, that, that situation of the cartoonist, this peaceful person using his pen and yeah, pen and ink, you know, uh, to express an opinion that could have such major ramifications and have such a huge uh, um, impact is really what the phrase, the pen versus the sword, or the pen is mightier than the sword is all about, you know? And ultimately as a cartoonist, um, when you embark on, a, on, on, on an image uh, that is, is potentially very, very powerful and, and, um, and, and in today's world, it can go viral and you know, lots of these images do. And it can also be manipulated. And many of the cartoon co controversies that we've seen around the world and in South Africa as well have been manipulated. You know, the, uh, the public response 
um, you know, via social media has been manipulated and it's, 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 it's gone way over what the cartoonist could ever have anticipated. And in fact, I was reading an interview with Zapero uh, when I was prepping for this, um, this webinar um, in, in which he was talking about the fact that many young emerging South African cartoonists, and we do have a lot of uh, black political cartoonists in South Africa now, um, unlike before, um, but a lot of them are scared of, of, uh, of not so much of the government coming down on them, um, because the, uh, compared to other countries, you know, governmental uh, persecution of cartoonists in South Africa doesn't, is, is not really comparable. Uh, if you look at the other countries where cartoonists have been harassed, harassed and imprisoned and interrogated, that sort of thing used to happen in South Africa under the apartheid regime. But because we have freedom of expression uh, um, guaranteed in our um, constitution, um, uh, cartoonists are protected by the, the, by the freedom of expression clause. Um, and, uh, and what people fear these days is not so much uh, the heavy hand of the state in this country, but the, um, the impact of what's now known as cancel culture. You know, the, the, uh, the enormous negative responses that, that come from the public. And sometimes these are even more conservative than the government. So it's a whole new world in which young cartoonists have to deal with the, with the, with the, the issue or the problem uh, that their work uh, might raise a, like a Twitter storm um, in which uh, all sorts of people are, um, you know, with huge amounts of people are, are blaming them and, and, and shouting them down and trying to cancel them out. Um, and that's a new, completely new situation that's, you know, less than a decade old that uh, where cartoonists now have to deal with, um, with this kind of public response to their work on such a mass scale. And it raises a whole slew of questions and issues relating to the to the kind of uh, world we live in and the, and the role of the media in this world. Um, the main difference, say, between the apartheid era and now is that when, when uh, the media were dominated by, well, in this country, um, radio and television were very much controlled by the state. And then the other publications that, uh, that were presenting an alternative viewpoint like the like the, the, what was in the Weekly Mail became the Mail and Guardian and other alternative uh, publications. Um, there was a, a completely different situation because in each of those cases, the opinion that comes through the publication passes through an editor. So there's editorial control. But now with, um, with social media, you don't have to go through an editor to get your, your opinion out there. And um, it's a completely new environment. It's not something that I personally have experienced, but I've observed it. And I'm just wondering what my colleagues on this panel think about that. Right, I mean, I think, um, I think Andy, you, you are kind of raising something. I mean, I would say that um, we should be kind of like, maybe careful to conflate kind of like cancel culture with, um, you know, with some of the, the really kind of like more serious sort of um, implications of, of kind of censorship. I mean, I think that um, it is definitely, a, I think, a different world. And, um, you know, people are a lot kind of quicker to, to have opinions now. And um, obviously they are. And obviously, you know, people also have the freedom, you know, of criticism and of reaction to, to comics, which I think maybe is, um, is kind of a bit different to how it did work kind of in the past, you know, where you, you know, it wasn't, um, you know, might have somebody writing into the paper or, what have you, but it wasn't kind of as sort of um, at the at your fingertips as kind of being able to somebody post something and then you know within kind of a few seconds that you've responded. But I really liked what you were bringing up about the fact that you know there aren't um, you know there isn't as much editorial control now um, because you know people can can publish their comics um, freely anywhere, which is fantastic. But I guess um, what I would like to, to ask the panelists is how do we um, strike a balance um, that is between, I'm gonna move my thing now, no, no, but um, how do we strike a balance between um, also sort of looking at, at kind of our own um, kind of ethical sort of like practices, um, you know, as artists, 
um, as creators um, and as you know political commenters and um, obviously we without getting into kind of um, you know full on kind of self censorship. Um, so I would love to to hear what your thoughts are. Um, Andy, I think you've kicked off the conversation very well for us. Um, I don't know um, if one of one of our other panelists would like to respond. Um, somebody put up a hand. Okay, so let's let's hear from let's hear from you first. I'm just gonna shift over to a slightly less sunny spot. <laughs> I think um, when it comes to <clears throat> drawing cartoons, uh, we we should not just think of ourselves, but we should think of others, other upcoming artists as well. I did share with Zapiro. I've met a few times. I met him um, two years ago in in um, Addis Ababa in Ethiopia, and um, he, he did disagree with me. But I thought well, when you're drawing cartoons, you need to know where to draw the line. And that's one of my uh, cartoons I did um, where I drew a hand, which was of a cartoonist and uh, with a line going to a bomb to explode. And um, when it comes to drawing cartoons, I, I think we have to be very careful how we go about um, um, producing our cartoons and not to touch on sensitive issues that would stop up and coming artists from, 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 um, from getting onto the podium of whereby, whereby they can draw cartoons as well. Because the way we see things now, um, uh, the way that um, the hard um, cartoonists are working now, some some are working under some some are working in difficult under the difficult circumstances, and um, but I believe as well that um, we want to bring out humor, we want to bring out um, messages in our cartoons as well, but we don't want to personalize the cartoons by by drawing what we feel, but we, we need to draw what the minds of many people are thinking of and what they have in their minds. So I believe that drawing drawing cartoons um, is a good thing and, and, and um, we need to help the up and coming artists as well to, to get into the field of drawing cartoons. So there's no, there's no kind of blockade whereby people cannot draw cartoons anymore because everyone's worried what, what they're going to say, what they're going to draw and how, how, how impactful their work will be. Is it going to make, is it going to make any sense? Is it going to hurt anyone? Is it going to hurt them, people in the various religions? So one has to be very careful when it comes to drawing cartoons. And, uh, but I'm sure there's, there's, there's hope, there's, there's, there's a future for cartoons. It's just evolving. And we as a we as a cartoonist just need to know how to go along putting across the message without offending. Because I, I don't think um, that by offending, using cartoons to offend, will get anyone anywhere. But at the same time, we can put across our messages without being offensive with the cartoons. So in terms of striking a balance, we need to know how to do that and get that right without um to, to without us being in, in trouble or up and coming artists not being able to draw because of what we, uh, the cartoonists ahead of them, have done. I hope that makes sense. No, oh, that that was such, that was so beautifully put. Um, I think I, I couldn't um, I think I couldn't agree more. Um, I mean, I think that you know maybe one of the things that kind of stands out to me about what you're saying is, you know, we also you know our goal is not to to alienate and to you know, to offend, it is, it is to, it is to, to challenge and it is to reflect um, and create reflection. But, um, <clears throat> you know, we are creative people. We can definitely find ways to do that without um, <clears throat> causing um, harm. Um, and I think that, you know, being an artist, um, being a creator, it is a responsibility as well, you know, and, um, you know, as much as, as much as we, it is a right um, and one that we, we all need to to fight for, and that, that we should have, and that isn't the case in many countries. Um, it is also creation as a responsibility. I think um, that's sort of my take, and yeah, I think that you put that really well. Um, Chair, I think that you also wanted to make make a comment, perhaps, on that. Yeah, yeah definitely. Um, uh, basically, uh, I, I agree with a lot, but not everything that that Tyler said. Um, uh, it's uh, first of all. Andy is quite right. It's a, it's a very difficult environment um, that we operate in. Um, and, and part of it has to do with, with people on social media being more vocal. Uh, part of it also has to do with globalization and the fact that if you make an image for a particular audience in one country, it can travel around the world and can be completely misunderstood in other parts of the world. Because in the Netherlands, symbols uh, and ways of satire we use might be very upsetting and very offensive uh, in Argentina. 
uh, or, or in Canada or, or wherever. So, so that, that's also part of the problem that, that if you create something using visual language that is uh, targeted at a specific audience, if, if it goes online and it travels, it can be completely uh, have another meaning in another country. Uh, yeah. and we of instances of, of that happening so so um that 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 is part part of you know what what makes the current environment uh, challenging um the thing that is also true for me about political cartooning is that uh it's it's i don't set out to be offensive because basically if you anger people you're not going to get your message across uh because people are going to be angry at what you drew and not the point that you're trying to make so so that's definitely a part where i agree with tayo um that's that's you know um, not the way you want to go about making satire or making a hard-hitting political cartoon. But the fact is that cartoons need to be hard-hitting to, to get people thinking. They, they need to be punchy. They need to have an impact. Um, so it is, in my opinion at least, uh, part of a cartoonist's goal to, to kind of toe the line between uh, not being offensive, but being hard hitting enough to, to get people, uh, to, to, to elicit a response from people when they look at your image. Because if you make a really tame image, uh, everybody's going to go like, meh, well, yeah, okay, it's a cartoon. Um, well, my goal is to, to really, you know, um, uh, knock you for shocks with an image and, and, and that you're going, hey, wow, what was that? Um, uh, oh, wow, I see what the cartoonist means. And uh, that, that really uh, is something that I need to think about. Um, and, and that's, um, I'm just going to pause you. Um, I'm just going to pause you quickly because um, we have a, a question for for all of the panelists. But I think that um, it's kind of within the scope of what you're talking about. Um, and that is um, the question is: What are the thoughts from the panel regarding the outcry from the Muslim community when cartoons of Muhammad are drawn, especially um, from the context of the Charlie Hebdo incident? And I think that this is kind of what we have maybe been skirting around a little bit is that this is kind of, I think, one of the most well-known um, in, you know, incidents. Um, and also, I think that, um, that it, it does also kind of go back to what we are, what we have maybe touched on a little bit about kind of what are the sort of the responsibilities and how, how do we avoid um, alienating um, or, or creating harm? Um, so what are your thoughts on that, Chair? Um, well, first of all, I, I uh... First of all, the, the most clear thing is that that violence is never an answer to satire. So, so let me make that thing clear. So, so that's always an unacceptable response to someone drawing a cartoon. Um, that said, I, I think it's uh, it's fair to say that it's counterproductive at this point in time to draw the profit because you know what's going to happen, um, uh, and it's not going to be Muslims thinking about your work and saying, hey, hey maybe he has a point. You know, you're going you're going to get a strong reaction, and it's probably not the kind of reaction you want. Um, for me, the ideal end goal would be for cartoonists to be able to, to draw the Prophet Muhammad, to, to draw any religious symbol, because I think religions and definitely institutions like the Catholic Church or Islam, which are really also power structures that define how societies work, uh, define how politics work, uh, define what policy is being made, um, they should be a legitimate target of satire. Uh, uh, so, so, so uh, for, for me, satire is this continuing discussion and hopefully a peaceful discussion uh, uh, about why satire is important, why offending those in power is important, uh, why cartoonists do what they do. Um, and through that ongoing discussion, make people clear that um, uh, they might get offended once in a while, but, but it, it kind of uh, is outweighed or, or the, the, the value of cartooning, of political satire in general, is so important within a society um, that, that we take it for granted that uh, offenses sometimes happen, we'll have a discussion about it and we'll move on. Uh, so, so that's my, 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 my short take on, on it. I, I, I can say that um, um, when, when the um, John Hebdo incident happened many years back, I did say, and I still maintain that um, you need to know when to draw the line, which is which is when um, what, what I meant by that. If I can describe it, I don't have the cartoon right here. I had a hand drawing with a, a line drawn to the hand, and the, the pencil lines became turned into became like a, a bomb waiting to explode. And I wrote on the bomb religion. So I didn't say I didn't say Islam. I didn't say Christianity. Religion generally is a very sensitive area. I mean, we have the Hindus. We have we, we have, um, we have um, various religions around the world and just need to be sensitive to other people's religion because um, if you're not sensitive to it, there, there could be 
have the, the Pope, the previous Pope, has been drawn with a condom all, 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 all over his head, all over his body. But um, reactions could be could be could differ from one another. But I still believe that cartoonists should know where to where to draw the line. There are lots of Muslim cartoonists who are drawing fantastic cartoons. But what they don't do is draw cartoons about um, Prophet, their, um, Prophet Muhammad. But there, there are lots of, I have lots of Muslim cartoonist friends who are doing fast, fantastic cartoons. But what they don't do is just um, satire the, the, the Prophet Muhammad. So knowing, to, knowing where to draw the line is very important. And that's, um, that's one aspect of many issues around the world that we need to be conscious of and know how to approach it so that there's, so that at times, and also um, based on cartooning, my cartooning through the years, I found that um, sometimes cartoons can be can can mean many things to many people all around the world and can be misinterpreted. And what 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 the thoughts of the cartoonist may not be the thoughts of uh, the reaction or the thoughts about what brought about the reaction to um, to the cartoon itself, and then the cartoonist then finds him himself or herself in a in a, in a in dire straits in a trouble uh, that come that brings about protests around the world. So sometimes cartoons cartoons can be misunderstood. So for the cartoonist, the cartoonist will have to look at the cartoon very well to see that the message in the cartoon is not is not is not what other people are thinking of, but then again, a cartoonist can speak. A cartoon can speak many, many can speak in volumes and, in, and mean many things to many people. But at the same time, you have to be conscious of the fact that if it's a sensitive cartoon, you should be the judge of it because you should, if you know that that cartoon is going to cause trouble, then it means you did that intentionally. But if you know the cartoon is not going to cause any trouble, then that's fine. And the message, you don't like Kijed said, you don't want the message to be lost. And that's what's important in drawing cartoons. Don't let the message, your thoughts, be lost and be misinterpreted into other things. That's very important. Yeah, I think um, I think you know what's what's kind of coming through is that um, yeah, cartoonists are in a difficult position. I'm going to get to to Nando as well for his take on it. Um, but I think that there there is kind of a, a fine line to tread, right, between kind of rights and responsibilities, and also between um, you know sort of being kind of um, being sensitive and in, in how we sort of um, portray certain um, certain issues and you know, then producing a comic which is toothless, which you also don't want. Um, so I think that, you know, cartoonists, I mean, you, you really have to be extremely skilled. Um, but let's hear, Nanda, what are your, what are your thoughts? Um, can you speak to me? Yes, I'm uh, to Yeah, you. I, I got into a lot of trouble doing it. <laughs> okay, I got into a lot of trouble doing a cartoon on, on, on the Catholic Church. Um, the Catholic Church was against condoms being used in the fight against AIDS, but there was a bishop who spoke out against it and, and he actually wanted condoms to be used because he said it would fight. It, uh, it was a, at a time when AIDS was really right. So I did a cartoon on Father Darling who was speaking out against uh, the church you wanted condoms to be used. So I, I had Father Darling reading out the, the, the prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy condom comes. And I got into a lot of trouble for that. <laughs> um, I also got into the cartoon of Modi. Now in South Africa, a lot of Hindu. Oh, Nanda, I, th I think we lost you there. Um, guys, I, I know that um, I know that we all have um, kind of a lot more um, a lot more discussion to yeah. have, and um, I think, um, but our time um, on the on the air is um, is reaching an end. Um, so, if if you guys are keen, I, I'd love for us to to chat a little bit more kind of after this. But for now, I'm going to have to say um, thank you so much again to the organisers of this festival. Um, thank you so much, Andy, Nanda, Chiad, Tayo, for um, for giving your giving your thoughts and for engaging in a little bit of discussion. Um, I mean, I think that we we know that there's a a much um, a much more in depth one to be had here. But um, thank you again to all of the people who submitted cartoons for the competition. Congratulations again to to Daniel Sheldon for for your winning um, winning comic. 
Um, and yeah, thank you for, for joining us this afternoon. Um, and I really encourage you to, to check out all of the panelists' work as well. Um, and I'm sure that they are, are open for you to to um, to contact them. And if you if you are interested in their work and want to know more, maybe about what um, what each of them are, are doing and some of the the programs that they're involved in, um, I think please don't be shy to to bug them a little bit. Am I right? Yeah. Okay. Um, Okay, thank you so much, guys. Um, thanks again to, to the organizers um, for the conference. Um, and yeah, and for this for this um, all too short session. <laughs>